Um, cool. So yeah, like I mentioned, uh, my name is David. I'm here tonight to talk about Ruby on Docker. Um, and so actually, you know, starting to try and decide what specifically I was going to talk about, um, I really came down on the topic of packaging and distribution. So this is basically like, it's a huge part of software development. We don't actually necessarily talk about it that much, but it is basically all of the pieces of are all of the things that you do once you've written the code. So like you wrote the code, it works on your laptop, and it's great, but now you need to give it to somebody else. You, know, you wrote a tool that they're gonna run on their machine, uh, you're gonna put it on a server somewhere, or it's basically just gonna run somewhere else that's not in your computer, and you need to figure out how to make that happen. Um, so I've been thinking about this problem for a long time. As I'll mentioned, um, I wrote an open source tool called Foreman. It's been installed about 10 million times. I, I was the original maintainer of the Heroku CLI, so that was also distributed on quite a lot of computers. Uh, my team at Heroku was also responsible for creating build packs, so we were thinking about how to take Ruby applications and Django applications and Node and Java and kind of massage them into a common format so that they could all run on the same system. And then my current project now is Convox, which is uh, open source infrastructure automation tools, so kind of taking the same sort of approach. How do we how do we take the stuff that's running on your computer and get it to run in other places? And so in talking about Docker, you know, preparing this talk, I was kind of you know, started off really kind of getting into the mechanics of Docker and like how do you actually build Docker files and you know, how do you actually you know, use Docker and was gonna show you some examples. It, when I started doing that, I actually kind of started taking a step back and I actually realized that I actually just wanna talk about why you should you care about Docker at all why you should care about containerization, this kind of technology, why you should care about packaging and distribution, and sort of why this is important. Um, and, and yeah, so I guess to get started with that, um, I kind of like to, to start with a story. So going back to about 2008 or so, I was uh, an intrepid young Rails developer. Um, got kind of tired of having like five terminal tabs open all the time to, to be able to run a Rails app. I had my web app, my worker, and like a Redis and a Postgres, or some other stuff going. Um, got pretty tired of it, wrote this tool called Foreman that kind of just interleaved it all in one screen. Um, and yeah, it was great. You know, I kind of gave it to all of my friends and version one of the readme, this was the install instruction. It just said, gem install Foreman. <laughs> um, that worked great for me. That worked great for all of my friends, the people I worked with, most of the people I was talking to at the time. And yeah, everything was, was great um, until Foreman started to get a little bit more popular. So it turns out that this problem is not unique to Rails. Uh, Java applications, PHP applications, sort of all of these uh, web frameworks, everybody had the same problem. They're running two or three different things to keep their applications running. And so I started to get a lot of bug reports that looked like this. I'm trying to install your software. I have no idea what to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, especially Python developers would get mad at me because I was asking them to install Ruby. Um, and so, yeah, so, so as a result of that, I started like actually going around and taking inventory of like, what are all the things that Foreman actually needs to run to be, you know, what, what do you need on your computer to run Foreman? So, you know, like, you know okay, yeah, you need Ruby gems to install it. And okay, I guess, yeah, you need Ruby uh, to, to run all this and maybe a specific version. But it turns out I'm actually using some C dependencies in there. So yeah, you, you need make and GCC also. And the actual instructions for installing Foreman started to become way more complicated than Foreman itself. And that was, it was tiring for me, it was frustrating for everybody that was trying to install it, and it just wasn't a great experience for anybody. And so after kind of thinking about the problem for a long time and, and trying to, trying a bunch of different things, the thing I ended up coming up with is sort of like going with the old school installer. It's just, and I'm gonna give you one file, you double click on it, and I'm gonna give you everything that you need to run Foreman. I'm gonna give you a Ruby, version of Ruby that I know about. I'm gonna give you a specific version of Ruby gems and all the dependencies and basically everything that you need to run Foreman. I'm gonna put it in your path for you. I'm gonna take care of everything. And this is really sort of like, I, I think that the best experience for the people that were actually using Foreman. It, it kinda sucks to, to build one of these things. I don't know if you've ever done it, but MSIs and PKGs are terrible and the people that made that software are sadists. Um, <laughs> but, you can't but, yeah, right. So, so yeah, I mean, this was actually pretty, pretty nice for, for the people um, that were using Foreman. And so the reason I kind of bring all that up is uh, you may say to me, I'm not writing a CLI tool that needs to run on Windows and OS 10 and Linux and all these various you know, computers and programming. I'm a Rails developer. 
I install my software on a server, and I control that server, and I control the environment, and I control everything about it. I don't really need to think too hard about this problem. You know, I you know, I've just started my project. You know, I went out to DigitalOcean or something, and I built myself you know, a VPS, and you know, I put my project on it, and I installed you know the versions of Ruby and Node and sort of all the things that I needed. I keep trying to run it, and something breaks, and I figure out what I need to install, and you know, I get through that whole process, and great, now my application's up and running on my VPS, and everything's fine. And this actually will get you really far. Um, you can run quite a lot of application on a single Rails process these days, actually. But the real problem comes in you know, trying to keep this thing up to date, right? Like Ruby versions constantly increase, nodes constantly increasing. There's sort of like all these moving targets. Do you have the same versions of these on your server as you have on your laptop? Um, that can introduce a whole like, class of weird bugs that will, you'll waste a lot of time on. And if your application starts to get a little bit more popular or people start using it, suddenly you'll run into the problem of scale. So now you need to run three VPSs out there. And now you not only have the problem of keeping these things up to date, you have the problem of keeping them in sync. So you need to make sure that all of them are running the same Ruby version as each other, um, et cetera. And so you, know, you very quickly end up, you, know, you come to some sort of management tool, Chef, Ansible, Puppet, something like that. Uh, you build yourself a bunch of scripts that can go out and create these servers for you. Um, you know, it gives you the right version of Ruby and Node and, and everything that you need. And then you use some sort of deployment tool to actually like come and put Rails on these boxes in the right place. And you know, you've built yourself a bunch of software now, which is which is okay. And but everything is actually running pretty well now. Like you, you can again get even further on this setup. Um, yeah, you know, this this is basically like I, I would probably guess that like ninety percent of like the production Rails applications out there that are doing serious things look something like this. The real problem with a setup like this is that you've basically solved the production problem, but now it comes Monday and you hire a new engineer, and you give this engineer a brand new MacBook, and this MacBook has no software on it yet. And not only that, she comes in and she says, "Oh, hi, this is a great MacBook, but I'm going to run Linux on it." And I tried to clone the, the Rails application for the company, and I ran into this. <laughs> what version of Ruby are we using? Is there a list of dependencies somewhere? And basically, they need to solve the whole problem all over again. So this is the reason that you should use Docker. So Docker basically is a way, at least for me, this is the, the most useful feature of Docker, is to be able to take all of the stuff that comprises your application, the code and all of the supporting infrastructure, you know, Ruby, et cetera, all these dependencies, and package it up into a single binary. So kind of like making the installer for Foreman, we've now made a single blob for our application that can run anywhere that we have Docker. We don't care what's inside it. We don't care what software is running in it. We don't care what version of Linux is in it. We don't care anything <laughs> other than that I have an image, and it listens on port 80 and 443. And that's actually a, a pretty powerful primitive. So the way that Docker does this is uh, through something called a Docker file. You can just put this right inside your repository. This is a really simple Docker file. Um, you can see it says I'm starting with Ubuntu, and I'm going to install Ruby and Node, and I'm working in slash app directory. I'm going to run bundle install and copy all my files into slash app, and this is the command that you use to start this server. And basically, this is now codifying all of those things that are not my application, that my application needs to be able to run. And so yeah, it's being able to take and package this application up into sort of this you know, standalone image where you don't necessarily care about the contents. And that actually makes a lot of the problems we were talking about earlier easier. So when I go to deploy to production, now all I need is servers with Docker on it. If my servers have Docker, I don't care about what else is on them because all of the other stuff that my applications need are self-contained inside these images. So I can just run a couple of them on these servers. I don't have to worry about keeping the individual servers Ruby versions up to date or in sync or that OpenSSL is upgraded or that sort of all of these you know, maintenance problems that, that, you miss, that you run into by adding a lot of software to the server stack. The other thing that you can do is run more than one kind of application on the same servers. So maybe I have two apps, and maybe one of them uses Ruby 2.3, and one of them is in Python or uses Ruby 2.2 or something. And when I'm using this shared infrastructure of Ruby and all these dependencies on the server, now these applications can't really live in the same places, and et cetera. Um, it just makes this problem a lot easier, allows you to get a lot more efficient use out of your resources wherever they are. 
The other thing it gives you is that it's really easy to run one of these on any laptop also. And it really helps. One of the main benefits I have found of it is really helping me to solve this problem. Like I can bring the entire production architecture of the application back to a developer's laptop and basically make it act identically as it's going to when they go to deploy the thing. So our developer can now just boot the Docker image for you know, our application that we're working on, work in it, work in it, be going through that development cycle using an image that is identical to the one that's going to run in production. It's using the same version of Linux, the same version of Ruby, the same everything, because that was all defined in our Docker file. So yeah, if, if I can basically leave you with one thing, it's that this feature right here, Docker does a ton of stuff. It's like Git. You know, there's like a thousand commands and a ton of command line options and everything. But the one really, really useful thing about Docker, and the thing that I would encourage you to go play with because it's awesome, is this. It's Docker build. It can take basically anything that you can describe in a POSIX Linux environment and turn it into a Docker image. And then you can run it anywhere that has Docker, including your laptop, including a server, including really anything. Um, and that's, that's it, it's a short presentation, but I just wanted to try and convince you to go out and, and check out these tools. Um, they're, they're really interesting. I think uh, this is basically like, I think where a lot of the deployment infrastructure space is moving over time uh, for a lot of the reasons that I outlined. You know, basically making things more homogenous in terms of your infrastructure makes it easier to manage at scale. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm David, my company is Comvox, and this is how you can reach me, and do you have any questions? So Docker may be the only thing that's worse than Node about how fast breaking changes seem to come to. So, you know, someone who doesn't want to be leading edge Docker maintainer, how, how do you even get started without getting just killed by, you know, breaking changes coming out? Uh, so I would actually say twofold. One, I don't, there's breaking changes actually not so much anymore. Um, it's really started to stabilize. So you'll see new. Yeah, I mean, it has come, it has changed quite a lot in a year. Uh, so I would say there are still a lot of new features coming out. So there's a lot to keep up with for sure. But stuff that's already running pretty much stays running now. That I haven't really run into that as a problem. The the second way I would answer your question is that you should try Convox. We, we kind of wrap up all of this stuff <laughs> and, and make it really easy to use. So you should check it out. We um, solve these problems by kind of running the favorite boxes because. You know, we realize that people's OS X might 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 not all be synced, um, so I guess this is different because it runs natively instead of as as a uh, as a virtual box. So it depends on OS 10. Uh, the current sort of state of the art with Docker is called Docker for Mac. It comes out of Docker Incorporated. Uh, it is still virtualized, but barely. So it uses a project called XHive, which is uh, uses uh, OS 10, El Capitan, I think, and newer, basically built virtualization into the operating system. There's a hypervisor dot framework. Uh, Docker for Mac leans on that and does user space virtualization. So it's a lot lighter, no virtual box, no VMware, none of that stuff. Is that, is that on beta? Uh, I think it's still in the end of beta, but you can like go sign up and get right in now. Okay. So it's, uh, I think it's like a you know, th 30 minute turnaround or something on the sign up. It's not like a big deal anymore. Okay, yeah. Have you played with any of the alternative runtimes? I really like, I'm bought into containerization as like an architecture, but I run into some really weird Docker bugs and Docker issues, and I've read some of the code and I plan to test some parts of it. Like, we play with Rocket or System V and Spawn or any of that. Is there any compelling to you at all? Yeah, so Rocket is pretty compelling to me. Like, Rocket as a technology is pretty interesting. Uh, the one thing that I would say is that, kind of how I, I mentioned, like, Docker builds really the most interesting thing about Docker for me. That includes the whole like, ecosystem of images that, that is out there for Docker. Um, there's basically a lot of tooling out there around this stuff, and just like having more people building more things in it is sort of like, it, to me, it sort of doesn't actually matter what the, the middle technology is as long as we all agree on it. And, and that's, you know, Docker kind of like ran out of the gate there with that. Rocket does definitely do some better things around you know, image verification and security, though, that are, I would love to see the Docker project start to adopt. Uh, so <coughs> two things. One, thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> um, and, in, and in that vein, like, so the system that we use in terms of solving this problem is, you know, it's in the open, we have agent, 
know, you download our repository, you go vagrant, you go vagrant SSH, you take about vagrant SSH, you log into the box, and then go to the system, you run for up. Anytime we change one of our like applications, then you know it reboots itself in form and we are able to just keep testing and running. And this is a very nice uh, production workflow, but fairly short feedback cycles. So I guess my question is, is there an equivalent uh, short feedback cycle auto-updating workflow that uses Docker? Uh, okay, yes, yeah. so asking uh, about, uh, so trying to rephrase it, I ha currently has an existing workflow using Vagrant and Foreman and some other tools that gives you a really nice short development cycle to be able to, to test in. Uh, can you reproduce that, that same sort of short cycle inside Docker? Uh, I, I would say yes. Again, I'm going to kind of plug my own product here and say this is, this is what Convox does. Uh, so Convox essentially wraps Docker and sort of all these other technologies and tries to bring it into a, just a little bit more accessible usage. Uh, so Convox has a CLI. Convox Start is like Form and Start, but it does everything with Docker behind the scenes. So it aims to have the exact same experience as Foreman, though, but kind of using some of these technologies behind the scenes. So I would say, yes, check out Convox. <laughs> and, and that's uh, Convox is an open source platform as well as a product. That's right. Okay. That's right, yeah. Yeah, Convox is you know, totally open source. Um, it all, so we install it into your AWS account, so you can run Docker images on AWS really easily, uh, and then we kind of just make it sort of a, a very Heroku-like experience to to use Docker and, and some of these newer technologies. What's the development cycle look like? Then? So the development cycle, I mean, so <laughs> I don't know if I could, I'm going to anger the demo gods, um, but, but but essentially. We, we still use Docker on the local machine. Um, you know, I go into a directory worth of code, or of code and I type convox start. It you know, builds the Docker images, anything that needs to be built. Docker is very good about caching if you build your Docker files in the right way, so that's actually pretty fast. And then starts everything up locally, sets up you know, whatever needs to be done. You just edit code on your local laptop and, and things are synchronized back and forth between your machine and, and the, the Docker container that's running sort of transparently. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for rebuilding, it's kind of like we leave that up to Rails or Shotgun or sort of whatever your, your tool that you use to do that. Right, exactly. Okay. No. So yes, Vagrant, and it's actually like Docker itself, they tend to promote that method. With, with Convex, we don't. We actually say not to volume mount your code. It's, volume mounts are, are pretty terrible on OS X. VirtualBox is bad, VMware is a little better. Uh, both performance, they basically mount your entire user directory, in, or your slash users, not just yours, but all of them, into, into the, the VM, and it just like performance tanks if you have any kind of, you know, lots of files or lots of size in there. Yeah, so Convex is a two-way sync. Sort of like our sync, it actually uses the Docker, there is a Docker API to move tarballs back and forth in and out of a, a Docker container, so we sort of piggyback on that and sync changes, but it happens near instantaneously and we don't have all the overhead of volumes. What do you use the, the, from, from inside the VM to the local? Yes, so both ways. So the idea is, you know, if you're running your entire application inside the container, if you need to run bundle install or something, we still need to be able to propagate those changes back out to your actual directory of code on your machine, so we do. So, so if I really wanted to use Convox locally because it made that's, that easier to use, um, for like maybe, you know, newer developers coming in, I don't have to worry about teaching a lot about Docker or anything like that, because I don't even know that, right? But, so, but my, my, my uh, production system works like Kubernetes or something like that, like, uh, would this integrate with that? Sure, yeah, I mean, so Convox essentially just produces Docker images, and that's sort of like, the, the, one of the other questions about like, you know, what, why would I do something like this over Vagrant or something like that is that, these Docker images that you produce on your local machine, you could run those exact same images in production. Like I could actually just like copy them to production and run them there. Uh, so it's just kind of generating these Docker images. Right, so it's all Docker power behind the scenes, but yeah, you end up with Docker images, Docker containers that are actually doing all the running. So you could just copy those images into whatever production system. Sweet. I feel like this kind of got asked like three times but <laughs> what is so Without Convox, what would be the native way to get like the kind of vagrant like workflow? Like, you know, I have my GUI that like do 
week's episode of Barrett, like I had this like, it's an update on the PM. Like, is, is that volume of Docker normally? Yeah, so there's a tool called Docker Compose, which, which helps with some of this stuff. Um, Docker Compose will help you like start up multiple containers at the same time. You know, it's basically similar to Foreman. Um, and then, yeah, the sort of traditional Docker way is that they tell you to do a volume mount of your local code directory into the container and let it sync that way. There's a couple problems with that. I mentioned performance. There's also, like, sometimes you want to do some manipulation of your code directory in production that you don't necessarily want to come to development. Uh, asset compilation in Rails comes to mind. Like you want to run assets precompile, it's going to create some stuff in the application directory, but you don't necessarily want to like commit all of that to get, and you don't want it coming back to your code directory. So I think it actually makes sense to have the two things actually be separate and then just synchronize changes rather than trying to say these are going to be the exact same directory in both places. Anything else? I think I need to download Conbox. <laughs> <laughs> this video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.